Okay, we're going to start off with, um, with a little bit of audience participation. So I'd like you to relax yourselves. I'd like you to just focus on this image for a minute. And I'd like you to imagine that you were sailing across the Pacific Ocean about 400 years ago. Because this was the scene you'd have been faced with. You would have been in charge, perhaps on watch, and your sole goal was to make sure that the ship didn't run aground. So this is the scene you'd have been faced with. You'd have had no GPS, no echo locator, no sounder or anything like that. You'd have been only using your vision and you'd have to let your eyes adjust to the moonlight, presumably. So this would have been quite a good night for navigation. And like I say, your whole goal was to make sure you woke up the boat in case there was any signs of danger. So I'd just like you to stare at that scene for a minute and just imagine yourselves doing that. Those would have been sea turtle shells hitting the hull of your ship. And ancient mariners used to use that as a warning sign that they were approaching shallow water around submerged hidden atoll systems in the Central Pacific. Turtle numbers were so numerous back then, they would have been waiting on the outskirts of the atoll perimeter, probably sleeping at night. And as the ships got too close into shallow waters, the sh their shells would have hit on the base of the boat and the person on in charge would have woken everybody up and called everybody to arms. Contrast that with the situation we have now where nearly all sea turtles on our planet are classified as endangered by the IUCN. They're slaughtered for food primarily, but also for souvenirs. Uh, they are protected in many places now, obviously, but they're still heavily poached. And not only are we fishing out their numbers directly, our indirect effects of global climate change are also affecting their populations as well. The rising ocean temperatures rising air temperatures and rising sand temperatures that turtles dig nests in to lay their eggs are actually causing a lot of the eggs to turn female. So turtle eggs are the sex is determined by temperature. And so we're getting upwards of 90% females in some populations of turtles. It's estimated in parts of Hawaii that in another 20 years we'll have 100% female populations. And obviously that's not a good thing for population growth. It might be a good thing for, for the mood, uh, but it's not necessarily a good thing for population growth. So I just wanted to contrast that, really. We're going from a situation where turtles were so numerous, they could be used as an early warning system for running into shallow ground. And now we're facing a scene more like this. And there's quite a few of these accounts. If we turn back to some rather uh, uh, ancient tales of, of remote parts of the world, these are some quotes I took from some of the early writings by Christopher Columbus. The first one, which I've shortened, is, "'Twas if the water did boil with them." And he's actually talking about sharks in that particular quote. "'The oars did hit their bodies instead of making way in the water, an ocean layered with teeth." What he's talking about is when they were launching the small boats from the main vessel and going to shore, and what he's recounting is the fact that sharks are so numerous in density that they're effectively sort of hitting them as they're trying to row and make way through the water. Now, obviously, we have to be a little careful because these are embellished tales, but it's, to me, it still highlights the magnitude of change that we've faced on our planet. And shark numbers were indeed numerous. That's why they used to make people walk the plank. Sharks learned quite early on to follow uh, vessels. This is bottom picture, uh, rather upsettingly, is a slave trade vessel on its way to the Caribbean, and sharks learned to follow these vessels because routinely they would actually discard slaves uh, uh, on the journeys, and sharks would then would take those bodies for food. So there was a good reason that not just for isolation for these people uh, and possible drowning, but also because there were hungry predators circling the boats in many cases as well. This is more the scene we're faced with these days, where people will quite happily jump off a boat into the water in the Caribbean and enjoy perhaps a cocktail on the deck of the boat afterwards. There's very little threat of being eaten alive by a shark because the numbers of sharks have crashed so exponentially. Why is that? Well, again, for the same reasons as sea turtles, effectively. We, uh, we hunt them, and humans have done this throughout history. Think about when we first explored parts of New Zealand and wiped out the moa birds, which were these large eight-foot chickens, effectively, uh, things that hadn't seen predators before. Sharks are very aggressive predators. If you go somebody, somewhere where sharks haven't seen people before and you put a, put a baked hook in the water, they're very aggressive predators. They're very easy to fish out of the water. They're also uh, used for food and fin trade and various other exploitations. And so we've been very effective at fishing out their numbers at a global scale. So again, these historical accounts somewhat contrast with our current situation. They don't quite match up. And I think what's going on there is that we're actually seeing this shift 
in baselines. And why are we seeing this? Well, we're seeing it because humans have become the dominant force of planetary change, effectively. In fact, we've become such a dominant force of planetary change that a new epoch has been proposed called the Anthropocene. It's not an officially recognized geological epoch, uh, but it's a term that many people are using to basically describe the fact that we are the pervasive change on our planet. We affect weather systems, we affect chemistry, we affect natural abundance of, of organisms. And all of Earth's ecosystems are now affected by people, either directly or indirectly. I'm sure David spoke even about some of the most remote parts of our planet in the, in the polar regions are still impacted by people as well. I want to just try and visualize what I mean by that. This is a scene of the Earth at night. Now, for anybody that's immediately confused, this is obviously a mosaic of images. It's not night everywhere at the same time. So they've spliced these images together. But to me, it really highlights this sort of shocking impact, in this case, of light pollution on our planet, how, how amazingly we can change the conditions at a global scale. The next one's even slightly more terrifying. This is global vessel traffic at any one point in time. So these are connecting points that we move things around the ocean by boat. And of course, we move things intentionally, like cargo, but we also move marine organisms unintentionally, like invasive species. And look how much more the world has become connected now than it would have been four, five hundred years ago. It's quite incredible. It's important, I think, to separate some of these effects. So we have what I would call direct effects, which are going to be things like fishing and maybe uh, near shore nutrient pollution into our marine environment. But there are also these other indirect effects, like the effects of global climate change, rising CO2 emissions. So some of these direct effects only take place at specific areas. But other, other areas aren't safe. Even if you're in one of the most remote parts of our planet, you're still not safe necessarily from these indirect effects of people. What's driving all this? Well, people commonly throw out the term overpopulation. Actually, I disagree with that. It's not overpopulation, it's overconsumption. There have been many papers published that shows our planet can quite happily support many more people than it currently has, but at a lower rate of consumption. Okay, we overconsume. I drive a big truck that's probably unnecessary. Um, you know, we all have our, our small parts of our lives that are probably dictated to overconsumption. And this puts pressure on not just terrestrial resources, but also marine resources as well. And the frightening thing is, this actually started uh, quite a long time ago. This is a common curve. I, I just took it off uh, of a reputable site, but I'm sure you've seen something similar of the growth in human population on our planet that's projected to reach about 9 billion uh, by the middle of this century. And the point is, though, is that this rise actually started occurring way, 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 way back. Okay? Even in 1800, there was a definitive rise. And so the Anthropocene itself uh, started uh, you know, quite a long time ago, arguably, but it really kicked into gear come the Industrial Revolution and that huge ramp up in global vessel traffic and CO2 emissions. So not only have we become more numerous, we consume more, we become much more effective at doing everything. Take fishing, for example. We've gone from having quite basic resources when subsistence type based fishing to having fishing where you have things like aeroplanes helping you fish. You have planes telling you where things like tuna are. Not very fair on the tuna, I would argue. So you have not only huge container ships that have freezers on board that you can store enormous amounts of fish, you have spotter planes, you have echo sounders, you have uh, radars, everything is putting the favor in, in, in our court, not the fish's court. And so we're able to catch enormous amounts of fish in a very short space of time. Not only that, we're able to fish now up to a mile underwater. There are deep sea trawlers that are capable of, of trawling off of the you know, parts of like northwest of Scotland where we have these deep cold water coral beds and we're quite capable of trawling them for deep sea fishes. What all these changes mean is that our perception of the ocean is also changing. Um, again, I'd like a little bit of audience participation here. Does anybody know who all four members are on this slide? And my wife's not allowed to take part. CCMI, uh, not quite. Any other guesses for any of them? Sylvia Earle, correct. So if Sylvia Earle was the, was the former head of NOAA, the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Anybody know who this handsome chap is? Attenborough. David Attenborough, young David Attenborough, looking pretty much the same though. He doesn't seem to age too much. And anyone know who this chap is on the far left? Yeah. 
a young Charles Darwin, yeah. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that when Charles Darwin was sailing across the Pacific in 1840s, thinking about how coral reefs were formed, his perception, his experience of the ocean would have been very different to a young David Attenborough who came along much later. Be very different from Sylvia Earle as an older lady now exploring parts of the ocean. She was recently at a submersible in parts of um, the, the Caribbean. And if my young son, Brody, ever makes it uh, to diving in parts of the Central Pacific, his perception of the ocean will be very different as well from all the people who have come before him. The danger with that is that we all think that what we're seeing at the current time is normal. It's status quo. It should look like this. And this is a very dangerous phenomenon that's been termed a shifting baseline. This idea that what you expect a healthy marine system to look like actually has changed. You're unaware of the true baseline that exists. So to highlight this, this is a photograph of part of the Great Barrier Reef, which I'm sure you've all heard of. It's a huge reef structure off of Australia. And in this image, it's quite hard to see, but this is actually all covered in slimy algae. Now, this image was taken in 1994. And at the time, they were trying to work out, did the reef always look like this? And there were people who were saying, yes, it's always been covered in slimy algae. It never had coral in this particular region. And other people were saying, no, it must have had coral at one point. So somebody actually managed to dig back into some old photographs. And I want you to take note of this, ma this mountain in the background. And they found a photograph from 1883. And note the same positioning of the photograph with the mountain in the background. Now, it's black and white, but all of that structure you actually see there are corals. They are live corals living on the reef. So in this instance, an old photograph was able to rectify that shifting baseline, able to tell those people who were saying, this is the norm, to say, absolutely not. It's not the norm because, you know, a hundred years ago or just over prior to that, we had a very healthy reef system in this area. There have been some very other inventive ways to try to reconstruct these baselines that we're missing. This is one of my favorites. This was done by a student at, uh, in California, actually, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And she went to the Florida Keys, which have been heavily fished out, um, and she was able to find old photographs from fishing competitions. So they have a fishing competition every year in the Florida Keys where you have a few hours, and whoever catches the biggest fish wins, and you get the prize. Yay! And you put all the fish up on this billboard. And she was able to find photographs, because every year they take a photograph of the winning fish. And the billboard has never been changed, so it's the same size in every photograph. And because of that, she was able, using image analysis, to actually measure the fish and work out how long they were. Not only how long they were, but how they were changing back through time. So if we go to that top photograph there that was taken uh, in 1957, I believe, whereas the bottom one was taken in 2007, the top photograph there, the winning fish are big. There's a big hammerhead shark, huge groupers, things that are about eight feet long. You can now win this competition, it turns out, with a snapper fish that's about this big. Okay, so again, highlighting that shift in how the ocean has changed by digging into these historical photographs. Another one of my favorites, and, and truly inventive here, somebody went back through old Hawaiian restaurant menus and looked at the chef's special. Okay, what was the meal of the day? And often the meal of the day was what was most abundant, what was the freshest catch, what was, in most, what was most numerous. And they were able to reconstruct effectively, with some error and some artistic license perhaps, reconstruct the incoming supply of fishes. And I won't go into the details here, but effectively what they showed was that the delivery of large predators, which is what initially there was a lot of showing up in the menu, slowly dwindled, sorry, rapidly dwindled away and was becoming replaced by smaller fishes that are much lower level on the food chain. And it was signifying this, this rapid loss of large marine predators. So more and more of these examples started cropping up. And if you're interested in it, there's a fantastic essay that's been written that's open access. So you can go onto the internet and download this for free. Uh, the title is Shifting Baselines, Local Impacts and Global Change on Coral Reefs. It's written by Nancy Knowlton and Jeremy Jackson, who are both at Scripps. Uh, Nancy Knowlton is now at the Smithsonian Institution. She's a, a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences of America. And Jeremy Jackson is one of the most famous tropical reef ecologists in the world. And they wrote a three-page essay that, for me, actually changed my career path when I read it. It was that moving to me. And I want to read you the part that fundamentally changed where I took my research career. <clears throat> 
Imagine trying to understand the ecology of tropical rainforests by studying environmental changes and interactions among the surviving plants and animals on a vast cattle ranch in the center of a deforested Amazon, without any basic data on how the forest worked before it was cleared and burned. The soil would be baked dry or eroded away and the amount of rainfall would be greatly decreased. Most of the fantastic biodiversity would be gone. The trees would be replaced by grasses and soybeans. The major grazers would be leaf cutter ants and cattle and the major predators would be insects, rodents, and hawks. Ecologists could do experiments on the importance of cattle for the maintenance of plant species diversity, but the results would be meaningless for understanding the rainforest that used to be or how to restore it in the future. Very profound words, I think, and very telling. And what they're talking about there is this ability to try to reconstruct the past, to truly understand what ecosystems look like. How do we do that? Well, according to the 1982 movie Back to the Future, you build a time machine. It turns out it doesn't work, though. Einstein was very bright, and he's been so far unproven. No one can prove him incorrect, right? You cannot time travel. We can't literally time travel, but we can sort of pseudo time travel, I would, I would argue. And we can pseudo time travel by going to the most remote parts of our planet, where humans are absent, and at least where the direct effects of people have never, ever occurred. And it gives us a small glimpse, perhaps, into what things might have looked like before we showed up. And that's what I've done for my research career. I may mean, say my research career, it's been about 10 years uh, since I finished my PhD. And, and during my PhD, so since I started my PhD, and for that entire time, I've, I've dedicated my work to trying to get to these remote places and looking at what the marine environment looks like in these places. Uh, so I'm a coral reef ecologist by trade. I, I study tropical coral reef ecosystems. And our team tries to answer questions about how humans have disrupted these systems uh, by studying everything from the tiny microbes up to the big sharks that swim around on these reefs. We're also interested in why reefs don't look the same, even when you remove people. So I, uh, the first time I went to one of these long expeditions, I started realizing even when you remove people from the equation, reefs still look very different. And I became intrigued as to why that is, what drives that. And I'm truly privileged to have been to arguably some of the most remote coral reefs on our planet and in the first trip I ever went to one of these reefs, it completely turned on my head how I thought reefs function in an hour. I'd, I'd been a dive guide when I was younger in Fiji. Uh, I, I think I must have done well over, you know, maybe up to a thousand dives and seen a handful of sharks. My first dive in one of these remote places, I saw hundreds of sharks of numerous species. It was just absolutely mind blowing. And to try to sort of capture that for you, when I say remote, how remote I mean, um, both oceans, Pacific and Indian, uh, now. So here is the Pacific Ocean. This is Hawaii, just for reference, the Hawaiian archipelago. We've got uh, North America up here. You can just about see New Zealand down here. And that red dot is one of our study sites in the middle of the Central Pacific. It's about just over a thousand miles south of Hawaii, right on the equator. We have a similar study site in the Central Indian Ocean. So here's Madagascar, just for orientation in India. Um, and we have, again, this sort of very centrally located, very remote coral reef system. In this case, the Chagos Archipelago. This reef system here is the, known as the Northern Line Islands. And it's tough stuff, right? I have to go out into these very remote, beautiful places, and I have to try to pretend to my wife that it's work. And the problem is, is that people send back photos like this, okay? And this is what gets me in trouble, because I'm there on the satellite phone saying, oh, it's been dreadful, you know, it's been terrible weather, the conditions have been shocking, everyone's being sick. And then someone tweets something like this saying, hey, fantastic time we're having the Chagos Archipelago and here's our boat, just for reference, the small vessel that's left the big vessel here. And we've spent the afternoon walking around this paradise island. Um, obviously, I'm incredibly suited for the tropics, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> and, and so actually, for me, that's quite an ordeal. You know, two hours on an island like that, I, it's touch and go for me. So I have to be very careful. But truly sensational places. Before I assume too much, though, I want to back up a little bit and just to talk about what is a coral reef? What do I mean by coral reef? Well, a coral reef forms, essentially, if we look at the NOAA, you can download this from the NOAA website. It's a pictorial summary here. We have an island, effectively, the tip of a mountain that's just poking up through the surface of the water. And over time, that mountain subsides and sinks. So initially, when that mountain is there, we get life forming around it and growing. And that's where the reefs first form. And as that island sinks down, it can form these small sandy banks, which are known as islets, but the island is still somewhat present in the middle. And as it fully subsides, it 
forms what is known as an atoll. So the top picture would be what's known as a fringing reef, a bit like the big island in Hawaii, you know, the, the scenes out of Jurassic Park, those kind of big high islands. Those would have fringing reefs around them. Here we're talking about a barrier reef, so we still have a central landmass, but there's islands around it, so the Great Barrier Reef would be the biggest example on our planet of that. And then an atoll system has no emergent land other than these small islets, and it has full interchange of water between the central lagoon area and the outside deep ocean. And Darwin had it absolutely right, even back in 1842. So this is a sketch out of Darwin's book about the geology of coral reefs. And I don't see much difference, actually, between the, the modern pictorial version that Noah's put out and Darwin's original. And what's amazing is that Darwin actually only spent, I didn't know this until recently, he only spent about five days during that voyage actually observing coral reef islands. In total, five days. And in five days, he came up with a, with a, with a theory that still holds true today as to how they formed. Quite incredible stuff. How do they form? Well, they're built by scleractinian corals. Scleractinian is basically a fancy word for hard, hard corals. These are organisms, these are animals that lay down calcium carbonate that build these hard skeletons. But the special thing about corals, which you can see up here, is that this is a coral, so it's an animal, and it has the polyps are made up of numerous tentacles. Within each tentacle, there are these tiny little algae that live inside the coral in a symbiotic relationship. And these coral are known as zooxanthellae. And this symbiosis has evolved over evolutionary time, and it's, it's, it's symbiotic. So the algae are given protection from the elements. They live inside the coral and are protected from things like predation. And in return, the coral gets energy from the algae photosynthesizing. So the coral can actually feed on plankton. It's actually an animal. It can predate on plankton. But it can get up to about 90% of its daily energy requirements from these symbiotic uh, photosynthetic algae that live inside it. And this relationship is very efficient. Um, to give you the background of the actual little bit of science here for, for the actual relationship that's going on, it's, it's carbon dioxide from the water that actually reacts with hydrogen uh, to form a bicarbonate, which then reacts with calcium to form this calcium carbonate. And this whole process of reefs growing is known as calcification. Okay, so this whole thing is calcification. And these are clonal organisms, so every coral is made up of, of hundreds to thousands of little polyps that can share resources between themselves and form these large colonial structures. And they're so big they can actually be seen from space, with the Great Barrier Reef being one of the famous, most famous and largest on our planet. So this is the northern Great Barrier Reef here on the, along the coastline of Australia. And if I just zoom in, you can see these little coral reef islets that are offshore that actually afford protection from wave energy and things like that heading towards Australia. Now, they're called coral reefs, but I might argue they should be called calcifying reefs because it's not just corals that actually build reefs. If I was to take you on one of my trips, um, and we do this with students, I wouldn't do this with all of you, we just hurl you off the end of the boat, in you get, with a dive mask on, and you looked down, this might be a scene you're faced with. And actually, only a small proportion of this photograph is made up of, of corals. This is a coral here, this kind of brown structure. This is another one here, a different species. We've got some little mushroom corals over here. <coughs> but a lot of this image is not made up of coral, but it's made up of organisms that still lay down calcium carbonate. So all this pink stuff you see here is a calcifying algae that actually lays down calcium carbonate much the same way corals do and cements the reef together. So it's very important, not only for growing reef, but actually consolidating the reef as well and holding it all together. Even these green things that look like plants, they are indeed plants. They're, they're a macroalgae known as Halamida. Uh, they are a calcifying organism. This algae, although it has a thin veneer of living plant tissue on the outside, its central part is actually made of calcium carbonate. They look like little beads all stuck together. And when they die, those little beads fall onto the reef. They're sucked into the reef matrix and things like these crustose coralline algae cement them all together to help that reef grow. So we'd probably argue that ultimately we want reefs that have calcifiers, that are growing. Okay? Growing reefs not only keep islands above sea level, which if you live on them is a really good thing, but they provide ecosystem services to us as well. Reefs actually provide things like coastal protection. So they, they stop high wave energy reaching the shore and eroding it. They provide things like medicines. We've found many novel elements on reefs that actually are used in anti-cancer med medicines and treatments. Obviously, they support fisheries. So there's enormous numbers of fish on reefs, which we can fish and feed people with. 
Uh, they bring in money to countries through things like tourism. So again, think about scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef. And it's not always about money and food. Often these things hold huge cultural value for people. So in Tonga, which is an archipelago in the South Pacific, they actually worship a shark god that keeps them safe at a, in the ocean at sea. And those sharks are found on the reef. So sometimes it can be these cultural values we take away as well. The sad fact is, though, is that we are seeing a loss on our planet of these reef calcifiers. We are seeing more and more reefs moving away from being calcifying reefs to becoming these slimy seaweed reefs. And this is one of the only graphs I'm going to show today, actually, because I think we can tell a lot of this story without, without graphs. But we've just got time here on the x-axis. And this is the amount of coral that lives on a reef in the Caribbean over time. Somebody's worked out. And all I want you to take home is that that has ramped down quite tremendously since 1977. So on the y-axis, you can see it used to be that half the reef on the floor was covered in corals. And now we're in a situation where it's something like approximating 10% of the, of the floor is covered in corals, or maybe even less. In Jamaica, there are parts that average around 2% of the floor is covered in corals. I'd argue that's not really a coral reef at that point anymore. It's something else. And what is that something else? Well, it tends to look a bit like this these big fleshy green seaweeds. And these things don't lay down calcium carbonate, so they don't grow reefs. And this is happening across our planet and it's sparked huge concern. There's been a variety of big papers come out from very famous leading world scientists about the decline of coral reefs with things like you know, confronting the coral reef crisis, a, a paper here published in the journal Nature. It's not just this loss of coral though, being replaced by some of these big seaweeds. We're seeing this overall loss of things that just build reefs and transitioning into this world that is slimy and fleshy and does not lay down calcium carbonate. It's happening to such a degree in some places that islands are actually sinking and eroding away and they can't keep up with sea level rise such that they're actually vanishing. And in some parts of the Central Pacific, they've already had to relocate people. This isn't something that's gonna happen in 100 years from now. It's already happening on our planet. You may just not be fully aware of it. Well, I heard about all this before my travels as a, as a PhD student. And some of my first experiences were things like this, which was confusing because it didn't fit this idea of this loss of reef calcifiers and this transition into a world of seaweed. We were faced with images like this. This is an image my, my colleague took in the Southern Line Islands, which is a very remote archipelago in the Central Pacific. Stunning. It looks like an aquarium. Crystal clear water. Almost everything you can see in that photograph builds reefs. There is almost nothing that doesn't lay down calcium carbonate. An incredibly healthy reef system. And by studying these very remote reefs that are relieved from things like fishing pressure and pollution, our team has, I may have to go off the cuff here, let's try again. Bear with me a second. Our team has learned an enormous amount about how reefs function in the absence of direct human impact. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. So, We've been to numerous reefs, to these remote reefs, and, and some of our imagery has actually been so, I guess, compelling to people that it's been featured on the front of, of some of these published journals as well. And, and actually, some of the data we first started bringing back from these remote places, places, people were questioning it and saying, there's just no way it can be real. And we actually turned to imagery in some cases to sort of, you know, a picture tells a thousand words, right? So we started to publicize a lot of these images as well. Images where we're seeing lots of coral and lots of big fish. It kind of goes against the expectation that we, we would think of these days of all the big fish gone and all the corals gone. Just to highlight what that looks like to you, uh, I want to show you a graph. What I'm going to show you is the abundance of fish that live on reefs across about 40 islands in the Pacific. And I'm going to show you what proportion of their mass is made up by big hungry predators. I'll need to explain this figure to you just a little bit. So for the geography, we're talking about this square here, okay? Right in the central to western southern Pacific. And each of these pies represents an island. There's about 40 in total, spanning four archipelagos. We've got the Hawaiian archipelago at the top here, which many of you probably are familiar with. The Mariana archipelago over here, so near the Mariana Trench, you've probably heard of that. We've got Samoa and American Samoa down here, which you may have heard of. You probably haven't heard of places like the remote Lion Islands or the Phoenix Islands. These are very remote islands 
in the central and slightly southern Pacific. Each one of these red stars represents where all the people live. And I want you just to take in for a moment how the size of those circles changes as you get closer to those red stars. Perhaps start over here. This is a nice easy one. You don't need complicated statistics to start seeing a pattern there. So with all the islands that are near the people have very low, small circles, otherwise low numbers of fish on the reef. And as you move further away, you see higher and higher numbers and mass of fish. Not only that, and that's common as you can see down here, definitely common in Hawaii where you see all the people here and no people here because it's an uninhabited islands that are protected under federal law. And certainly all these islands where there are no people living here, absolutely not. And then right here, we've got a scattering, maybe 3,000 to 5,000 people. Not many, but still people. So the amount of fish when you fish goes down. That was a finding my old boss published, and he's still waiting from his, for his call from Stockholm for his Nobel Prize. He's probably not going to get one for that. If you fish, there's less fish, OK? Seems obvious, but no one had proven it, actually, on this scale. What was also very compelling was what makes up the fish. So the black portion of each of these circles are the top predators, sharks big jacks, snapper, and things like that. And as you can see, in these remote places, not only do we have more fish, but those fish are made up, a lot of the mass of those fish are made up by these big hungry predators. What does that actually look like? Well, it looks a bit like this. Um, and it can be quite unnerving at times. When I first started diving in some of these locations, I questioned some of my data because most of the time I was looking over my shoulder thinking, what on earth is going to happen here? Particularly when we were doing things like spearing little fish for sample collection. It can get very hairy very quickly. After a while, you get used to it, and after a while, they become more of a nuisance because they get in your way, and after a while, you sort of nudge them out of the way as you, as, you try to, as you swim along trying to count corals and things like that. But I just want you to take that in. That's what a high predator-dominated reef actually looks like. Now, a small caveat here, these were actually taken as part of a National Geographic expedition where they were actually starting to bait the water a little bit too, which I never advise doing if you have scuba divers in the water. It doesn't go well. Scientific researchers underwater trying to collect data, cameramen trying to get an exciting shot, and lots of tuna, dead tuna heads in the water is not a good mix, it turns out. So don't ever do that. So... We've learned that things like fish biomass is much higher when we remove the human element and that there are a lot more predators. What else have we learned? Well, we also learned that even if you remove people from the equation, reefs still look different. They don't look the same. And this was kind of my big um, Stockholm contribution, right? I'm not going to get a Nobel Prize for that either. Reefs look different when you go to different reefs. But the point here is that we can learn why they look different. And if we can understand why reefs look different naturally, that helps us to separate the effects of people, actually. We need to understand how reefs change by things when you, when you cross things like gradients in wave energy, for example. Because unless we understand that, it's very hard to isolate the human effect when we look at human-impacted reefs. So to show you what I mean by that, I'm going to take you to the Central Pacific. This is a group of islands called the Northern Line Islands. Um, and as part of that, I'm going to take you to Kingman Reef, which is in the, you see these little uh, red triangles here, Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll. They look like this. Uh, it's hard to find good photographs, I'm sorry, but on the left here, this little spit you can see just on the satellite image is a little bit of emergent land. It's about 8 to 10 kilometers across in total. This is Kingman Reef. And on the right, we have Palmyra Atoll, which is a, a slightly bigger reef system. If you were to swim around the whole circumference of this, it's about 55 kilometers, something like that. And we went out there, we led these remote expeditions uh, back in the day, and we basically jumped in the water at each of these places that you can see outlined here, and we counted how many fish there were, how many corals lived on the reef, and various other things like that. And we started to build a picture of what these reefs looked like and how variable they were. And they are very variable. If you dive in different places at, the, uh, at these islands, this is what it looks like. You know, at one point you can see lots of coral, the next minute you can see almost none. This is in a lagoon at Palmyra that's heavily uh, subjected to sedimentation. Some places you can see a lot of coral rubble and high numbers of sharks. Other places you don't see sharks. The point is there is natural variability across these reef systems. So we actually published these photographs as part of the paper, and it's the only time I've ever been accused of, of what, uh, these are his words, not mine, coral reef pornography. Uh, you know, oh, and sort of accusing me that it was to make up for the poor data in the paper. It wasn't. The data was fine, but I thought it was quite funny, the rants that you sometimes get on social media. So what did we learn? Well, we learned by visiting these very remote places that about 86% of what lives on the reef floor is actually made up of calcified organisms. And 74% of that are actually corals that are living there. 
What we actually also found, which was astounding to me, that was that less than 1% of the reef floor was made up of those fleshy seaweeds I was talking about before. Less than 1%. Contrast that with places like Jamaica where it's up to 90. But also there was large variation, as I mentioned before. You could go to one part of the island and it would have 20% coral cover, and another part of the island would have 70% coral cover. And we started to become fascinated as to why this is. Why do we see these changes in the abundance of things that live on the reef floor? Perhaps rather foolishly, I'm now going to try and summarize about 10 years of work in a single slide, which may diminish the impact, it may, my, the apparent impact of my work on the field. But here we go anyway, we'll give it a go. So we have learned so far this. We've learned that if you change the amount of food on a reef, which I'll call primary production, so this is the amount of phytoplankton you have in the water, which supports the base of the food chain. If you change that from going from low to high, you see very predictable things. You see things like fish biomass going up where there's more food, and seeing certain fish really benefit from that. Things like uh, grazing herbivorous fish, so fish that feed on algae. This is probably because more plankton in the water is fueling more algae. More algal growth means more things that eat algae. We see things like as you increase food availability, though some places we see more coral. Uh, we even see changes in the microbes that are predictable, such that microbes that live in areas where there's more uh, nitrogen, they have genes that are more geared towards breaking down that nitrogen and utilizing it. We see equally predictable relationships with things like temperature. So we see the benthos and the fish changing in ways that are very predictable. And finally, we see effects of things like wave energy, where you have really large waves the corals have to change shape in order to adapt to the reef. They have to have a very low profile. So you get lots of low-lying encrusting corals where you have very high wave energy and where you have low wave energy, you see big branching corals that build these large complex reef structures. So we've started to actually work out why reefs don't look the same. It's because we have these gradients in oceanography and climate that change how the reef looks naturally. Humans have been superimposed over this view so we've inserted ourselves into this equation and started changing a lot of these rules. And the challenge is to try and separate the two effects. And that's what our team has been doing. And we've learned an enormous amount by visiting these remote reefs. What else have we learned? I wanted to give you some of the other highlights. Well, we've also learned about diseases on reefs. So corals can get sick just like you and I can. They can contract diseases and infections. And these manifest in various ways. So to give you some examples here, this is a coral that actually has a tumor-like growth. Now, it's not true cancer. It's not true neoplasia, what you would call neoplasia for humans. Um, it's uncontrolled growth of a tissue type. So cancer is uncontrolled growth of a cell type. Corals don't display that, but they show a similar kind of phenomenon. They can contract bacterial diseases that lead to the death of their tissue. They can contract viral conditions that can lead to the death of their tissue. So we became interested in this, and actually for my PhD, this was my main goal, was to use these remote reefs to ask, well, how much should disease should there be on a reef naturally? If we're not there polluting and fishing, how much disease do you see on a reef? And it turns out, after spending many, many months at Palmyra, where they used to drop me off and pick me up a while later, um, it's less than 1% of the corals that you see on the reef actually show any signs of disease. Less than 1%. I then did some follow-up work in Oahu, which is an island in Hawaii, which is very pleasant to be on, um, but every other coral in some places that you swim by has a disease. Every other coral, 50% of the corals on the reef can show signs of one of these critical conditions. That's astounding. I wanted to give you an example of what this might actually look like. So this is a coral branch here. I have to just lean a bit. This is the healthy part here. And this is one of those tumor-like growths. They call them growth anomalies. Now, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is, if you took a piece of that coral and you sliced it very thinly and you mounted it on a slide and you stained it and you looked at it under a microscope, this is what you would see. I'll just orientate you. This is one of the coral polyps here, and there's another one there. So these things here are its tentacles that it uses to catch food. And these things here are its digestive organs, and it has these little canals that connect, like I mentioned before, each polyp is connected by what's called a gastrovascular canal. And they can capture energy in one part of the colony and pass it to other parts of the colony. That's what a healthy part, if you took a piece from over here, looks like. If you took a piece from the tumor, it looks like this. So 
The tentacles are still kind of there, so maybe they can still capture plankton and feed. But even if they do, there's not much point because all its digestive organs have gone. So it can't actually digest that food source and utilize it and pass that energy to the rest of the colony. So this tumor here is very expensive energetically to grow because these are big, fast-growing structures, but they're not serving their purpose. They're not paying back. It's a bit like a teenager in your household. You know, they take, 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 and they're not giving anything back to the common good. Okay? And that's what's happening with this tumor here. Not all teenagers, but certainly myself as a teenager. So I was initially quite excited by this, that we saw these very low levels of disease on these remote reefs. Maybe they were protected in some way by being so isolated. And then right towards the end of my PhD, I got a bit of a reality check when we went through an El Nino, where the ocean became unusually warm for a period of time. And at Palmyra, at that very, one of the world's most remote coral reefs, where there are no people, there's no fishing, no pollution, we saw a huge disease outbreak that spread very rapidly through these large table corals. Now this coral here is about five meters across. It's probably about nearly up to 60, 70 years old. And I watched some of these colonies contract diseases and die in a matter of days. This was a bacterial tissue loss disease that they were contracting that was leading to the necrosis, the death and rotting of their tissue, and was spreading like wildfire through these colonies. So this is the healthy tissue here. You can see this has recently died because it's very white. It hasn't, nothing's grown on that substrate yet. And here, this is some older death where we're seeing some little red algae starting to grow on the coral. And this particular population of corals, in a matter of weeks, we lost about 25% of the population in one of the most remote parts of the planet. If you were going to get somewhere that was going to remain healthy to global climate change, it would have been here. And yet we were still seeing the effects of global climate change in these remote places. These places are not immune to the reach of global climate change. Global climate change doesn't recognize a barrier that says this is a marine protected area. You can't go fishing. Of course it doesn't. When the ocean warms, it warms everywhere. And sadly, I don't want to be doom and gloom about this, but it's a bit of a reality check. Um, it's not just diseases. There is also a process known as coral bleaching that can occur when waters get very warm around corals. So if you remember those little algae that live inside corals that I mentioned before, under stressful heat conditions, the coral actually expels them. And it's thought this is a strategy um, to actually save energy. The process is known as coral bleaching. And what happens is the corals, you may have seen this in the Guardian newspaper, there's been a lot about this recently, uh, the corals turn white. They lose that pigment of the, of the algae that live inside them. And remember, if they're losing the algae, they're losing that energy that comes from photosynthesis. And so they are, at that point, running on reserves, if you like, on fat reserves that they've got from catching plankton. They actually don't have very long at that point often to survive. They need to quickly, the temperatures need to come back down, and they need to regain those algae. If the temperatures go high for too long, most of the time these corals suffer mortality. The mechanism by why they think corals actually expel the zooxanthellae is that that relationship no longer becomes symbiotic because the algae um, actually become a detrimental effect to the energy of the coral. Again, the teenager analogy almost works. So it's, you know, it's a bit like tenants that aren't paying rent. How about that? Okay? So all of a sudden, your tenants aren't paying rent. There's no point in having them anymore, so you ask them to leave, and that's what's happening here. The problem is when you ask them to leave, the corals then suffer mortality. So again, I guess I thought, well, okay, maybe there are some places in the world that won't suffer from this, that are immune in some way to this because they're so isolated and protected. And this is one of my study sites, Jarvis Island. I think probably one of my favorite places in the world to go diving by far. Um, it's absolutely stunning. It's huge coral cover, big foliose corals that almost look like roses. They're absolutely stunning. And enormous fish biomass, big predators like snapper and sharks, crystal clear water. Along the western coast of the island, up to 80% of the floor is covered in, in these corals that live there. And somebody did a huge analysis of corals all over the world and decided that Jarvis was one of the healthiest coral reefs on our planet. It was something called the Ocean Health Index. And this was an article by The Guardian that was published following that that, that called Jarvis, you know, the world's healthiest coral reef. Uninhabited Jarvis Island, halfway between Hawaii and Cook Islands, gets a score of 86 compared to global average of 60, I think it was, or something like that. So it was deemed to be the healthiest coral reef on our planet. A couple of years ago, during the most recent and largest of El Nino of our time, the ocean got very warm around Jarvis, and this was a scene that we were faced with. Um, this is that same west western coastline of the island where we saw almost 100% corals bleached, so that state where they've released those algae. And the sad fact was that 
upon following up a little while later, there was almost complete mortality of this entire coastline. There's about 5% of coral left last time somebody actually did a survey at Jarvis. Now, the hope is that because it's so isolated, that it will bounce back quickly. Those, those human effects that are there, that aren't there, excuse me, maybe that will give some resilience to the system so that it can grow back faster. There's lots of hungry herbivores that will eat the algae. Um, there's lots of food available for the corals. So maybe, with those humans gone, it will grow back faster and everything will be okay. And I truly believe that might be, that might be true. I, I do think if you remove local human pressures, reefs are stronger. They can combat the effects of climate change. The problem is that our, our climate is changing so rapidly. It's whether or not they'll have time. And this graph I want to show you is, is actually quite scary. This is a piece of work our team did not too long ago. What we attempted to do here was to work out well, how long have reefs got before they experience these temperatures where they will bleach every year? Because if you bleach every year, you have no time to grow back. In fact, long before that, you're probably in trouble, but we can honestly probably describe this as a real doom scenario. You know, we try to project forward, how long will this be? So we took um, various climate models, there are about 21 in total. We ran all these projections, these scenarios of what might happen, and we came up with sort of a mean answer across the entire globe. So for every coral reef on our planet, we came up with a pixel that was about four kilometers big that said, when we think in the future, this reef will bleach every year. If you take a mean of our entire planet, that number is 2043. It's not very many Wimbledons away. And that was an enormous reality check. That's the mean. There are some places that are actually set to get that in the next couple of years, and maybe even are already experiencing that. So this idea that maybe reefs will bounce back faster if they don't have these local human impacts, I worry about that because of the rate at which these warming events are set to occur. Now, there's some variability here. So there is some, I think there is some good news in this. You can see this actually runs from 2030 in the red all the way to 2060 in the blue. So you can see there are portions of some of these places that aren't set to experience this perhaps another 40 years or so. But that's not very long for us to actually do something about it. But I do think we can do something about it. I don't think we should just say, well, there's no point. I think that there have been numerous demonstrations where people uh, have intervened uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, and it's had a, a large, quick effect on our planet. There was a blackout once in New York City, I believe, where somebody took the opportunity to measure CO2 levels, and they drastically fell, of course, because people weren't driving around, they weren't going to work. And it just showed the person, wow, people can really make a difference quite quickly if we all act together, which is why I'll sell my truck very soon. So... It's actually a very efficient truck, just for the video. It gets 38 miles to the gallon, which exceeds many of my colleagues in my department. It's, si it's very slow. And actually, no <laughs> it's no justification. It's no justification. So I want to sum up now and just show you a couple of graphics, which we, we've actually, uh, we had an artist, we commissioned an artist to help us with this graphic to, to sum up a thought piece we've just written. Um, and this is how I imagine reefs prior to what I, that, that term Anthropocene I mentioned at the beginning. So there are still people in this reef scene. You can see somebody here subsistence-based fishing, somebody spearing on the shore, and here's the reef here with its island. Um, and I've put the human drivers in this sort of orange color here, and the things that make reefs look the way they do because of natural gradients in oceanography in blue here. So I imagine this is how the world used to be before the Industrial Revolution, where we've got, sure, we've got an effect of people, and these in some way feed into how the reef looks. But we've got a dominant structuring force of these natural things like sea temperature and, and how much food there is and how much wave energy there is. This is how I think some of these very remote reefs that we've been to somewhat still, they still operate under these conditions to some extent, especially the ones that lack this, um, even the local humans. This is what most reefs look like today. And by most reefs, I mean reefs in Australia, in the Caribbean, uh, in parts of Hawaii. A very different scene, not only in the way the reef appears, but in all the connections that actually structure it and make it look the way it does. We've got things like recreational fisheries, commercial fisheries, invasive species, tourism. All these things are feeding into how the reef looks. We've still got our variables that exist before humans were in large numbers. Temperature and wave energy, and all these are still acting but they are swamped by these socioeconomic human drivers that make reefs look the way they are. And what's interesting is that as reef ecologists for the last 20 years, we've been studying these things here, these sort of um, 
we can call them uh, local human impacts, if you like. But actually, these local human impacts are driven by much larger global level effects, things like human migration and urbanization, trade across our planet. Decisions that determine where trade goes in and out of places determines how much fishing there is effectively because it brings money into the area. And all these things are interconnected in this interwoven human landscape. And it really sums up for me how much more challenging it is therefore for us to start managing how reefs look and respond in this world. Because you can think of each one of these dots as a rule in a computer game. And we need to understand that if we turn one, how does it affect all the other ones it's connected to? And you can imagine that doing that here might be a lot more simple than it is here. Not only that, we've been understanding how reefs work at this level without actually thinking about these larger global effects that even human behavioral effects often that actually are, we've been studying their emergent properties, how about that, rather than their true cause. I'm sorry it was a little bit doom and gloom, the, um, I think it's important to have a reality check here because I think that coral reefs are one of the most beautiful, diverse ecosystems on our planet and we can do something about it to save them. If you're interested in this topic, I thought I would highlight a couple of really good popular books for you before we take questions. Um, this is one of my favorites. So there's, if you're interested in the shifting baselines topic, there's a popular book written by Jeremy Jackson. Um, you can get both of these on Amazon for under £10. Uh, a really great read. It's specifically focused on fisheries and how fisheries across our planet have changed. And this is a book by my friend, Professor Forrest Rower, who's one of the most famous microbial ecologists in the world. Super weird, uh, but very intelligent. He looks like a bat, and we call him the Dark Lord. Yeah? Yeah. He looks like Professor Snape, actually, if any of you know Harry Potter. Uh, a very intelligent chap, in his spare time, he doesn't sleep much, he writes popular books. In this case, he's written a book about how reefs work and his adventures in the remote Pacific with parts of our team. So thank you, everyone.